Hi, this is Miss Mason Explains Biology, Cognition, and Learning. All right, so biology plays a huge role in associative learning. For classical conditioning, we have John Garcia, and he wanted to find out why was it easier to learn associations that make sense for our survival. He discovered something called taste aversion. And these food aversions, taste aversions, they can be acquired even though the nausea, the unconditioned response, does not immediately follow the neutral response. And this is really prevalent in um, the, motion, uh, the morning sickness in pregnancy and in some illnesses. How come chemotherapy patients, um, they will associate um, with the clinic wherever they get their chemotherapy and they'll just think about it and they'll get nauseous. Well, it's because when you go to the clinic, you're getting the chemotherapy, which then associates with the nausea. So you see how that works? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Um, another study that's really interesting that shows the role of biology in classical conditioning is that males in one study were more likely to be uh, attracted to a, a pictured woman if the picture had a red border. Same goes for females. We are more attracted to males who are wearing red shirts like my man Chris Evans here. Yeah, Captain America. Mm. All right. Okay, now in operant conditioning, it's interesting because biology plays a huge role. Think about it. Can a monkey be trained to peck with its nose? No, because it doesn't have that type of a nose. It has like this, you know, like, like our nose, kind of squishy. But a pigeon can. Can a pigeon be trained to dive underwater? No, because it's a bird. It has wings. It, would, it can't breathe underwater. But a dolphin can. So operant conditioning, it encounters these biological limits that are extremely difficult to override, even if we, we say, all right, we're gonna learn to do this, but it's almost impossible because of our biology. And even if we do, we want that positive reinforcement, it's not gonna happen. So that's something to keep in mind when you're doing operant conditioning. So here's an idea. What can we most easily train a dog to do? Can we train them to detect scents? Yes, because that is what a dog natural tendency is. Okay, they climb, they balance, they detect scents. But can they put on their own clothes? No, they don't have disposable thumbs. They can't do it. It's very difficult because they're a biological limit. Simple as that. All right. So cognitive processes. So in classical conditioning, all right, how come, you know, um, the dog is salivating. Well, it's because they use these higher order uh, thinking skills, this cognition, and they learn to predict that the food is going to come. It's just something. All right. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see. Um, how come animals are able to do more target behaviors around the same time that they know the reward is most likely to be given? Well, because we're expecting the reward. Our cognitive skill allows us to do that, all right? And it's pretty awesome. Um, and as humans, we have that amazing ability that we can use that cognitive skill to respond to delayed reinforcers, all right? All right. Okay, and humans also have this amazing ability that we can set behavioral goals, not only for ourselves, but for others. And we can plan our own reinforcers, such as, hey, I'm gonna study for 30 minutes, and then I'm gonna spend five minutes on my phone. 30 minutes, five minutes on my phone. 30 minutes, five minutes on my phone. See how you can do that? Yes, yes, pretty awesome. All right, latent learning. Now we see this when um, rats, appear to form cognitive maps. Now cognitive maps are simply um, like uh, you know where you're going without having an actual map in your hand such as how do you guys know where to go for first period, second period, third period, fourth period? How do you know that? Can you tell someone how to get from your first period to your second period to your third period class off the top of your head? All right, and we see this when um, uh, cheese is placed in any of the corners of a maze, and the dog quick, or not the dog, sorry, the rat quickly picks up where are these, you know, where is this maze? How do, how do we figure it out? How can I get to the cheese? Okay, 
All right. So this idea of latent learning refers to skills and knowledge gained from experience, but not apparent in behavior until the reward is given. Okay. All right. So this would kind of be like um, if you don't realize that you've learned how to drive. Okay. Um, but not until like you've actually gotten behind the driving, behind the wheel. All right. Mama, my medicine. <sighs> Hold on, guys. All right, I'm back. Um, okay, so where were we? Learning rewards and motivation. So we all have intrinsic motivation. Sometimes I wonder if some of us have more than others, but we all have intrinsic motivation. This is the desire to perform a behavior well for its own sake. Um, some of us feel this with, we just have a desire to get A's on all of our exams, okay? So, and the reason why you do this is because the reward for, for performing this task well is, is the positive reinforcement that you need. Extrinsic motivation refers to doing a behavior to receive reward from others. This would be like, oh, the only reason why I'm going to get A's is because my parents give me $100 for every A I earn. Okay? That would be an intrinsic motivation. Sometimes... Intrins, uh, intrinsic motivation can be reduced by these external rewards and they can be prevented by using um, continuous reinforcement. So that's one of the sad things. RG3, I want you guys to think about him. What might happen if we began to reward a behavior someone was already doing and enjoying? Okay, RG3. He was a great football player. Then he came into the NFL and he receives way amount of money and a lot of fame and a lot of press and now what happened is he enjoying his you know playing football anymore he went through a rough patch where it wasn't a joy anymore he got injured and he's not playing as well is it because it's instead of intrinsic motivation playing football just for the sake of playing football now he does it to receive rewards from others from the money and all of that. So it's kind of interesting to see this actually in person. RG3 is a great example of how extrinsic motivation can reduce intrinsic motivation. All right. Okay. So there are two types of coping strategies for personal problems. So you have a problem. Yep. Can you change it? It all depends. If you feel like you cannot change it you are going to focus on emotion focused coping if you feel like you can change it you'll go with problem focused coping problem focused coping is where you're going to work out the conflict all right so let's say you and your family are in, you and your family are all at odds you will pick the person that you are having the most conflict with and you will go and actually talk to them and you will try to figure out what's going on and how can we um, basically work it out okay we use the problem focused coping strategy when we feel self of control when we think we can change the situation all right emotion focused coping is the opposite when you don't feel like you can change the situation when you're stuck you are going to reduce the amount of stress that you feel the emotional stress by getting support and comfort from others yay we do this a lot. This is the one we see more people using emotion focused coping because we often feel like we can we just simply believe we can't change the problem. All right, we can't change the situation, so we're just going to talk it out and hope that it feels better. All right. The big risk with emotion uh, focused coping is that we actually ignore the problem. So it's kind of sad. All right. Learned helplessness. This makes me really, really sad. So there was an experiment by Martin uh, Seligman. He gave a dog no chance to escape from repeated so shocks. So you put him in a crate, and when the dog got to the door, shock. Got to the, you know, the door of the crate, shock, shock, shock. So what happened? Finally, turn off the shocks, and the door is just left open. What do you think the dog did? Sat in the back of the crate like just shaking in fear okay so it just totally gave up on trying to escape all right 
which is really depressing. So the dog actually learned helplessness, right? So learned helplessness is declining to help oneself after repeated attempts to do so have failed. Guys, we've all experienced this, okay? For me, there is, I, I, just, I have learned helplessness with cooking. Uh, it's it's just really sad. I love to bake. I'm really good at baking, but cooking not so much. Um, and it's gotten to a point where I, I I'm not even gonna try to cook anymore. I'll cook the simple meals, but not like you know the fancy dancy meals. I've just I have learned helplessness about it. I decline to help myself even because I've failed to do so so many times. All right, all right. So there's an example of learned helplessness. Do you have something that you have had learned helplessness for? Think about it. Do you? All right. And this also comes up with the idea of personal control. That people, um, if, they're, if you're given choice, not too many choices, but you're given at least, you know, two choices. Do you want A or B? then you're gonna thrive. You're going to feel like you have personal control and you are going to, um, you're gonna succeed, which is really interesting. All right, self-control. This is something I love, love, love to think about and talk about. All right, so self-control. Do you have the ability to control your impulses? So, um, Sometimes we call this your willpower, okay? And uh, psychologists believe that this is something that we have a finite resource, that it is brain energy, and that um, people who are asked to resist eating cooker cookies later give up sooner on a tedious task. So you're asked, hey, resist eating the cookies, all right? But you give up sooner on another task because you're you're focused so much on resisting the cookies that you you just you cannot um, you can't focus on like a really hard task. All right, believe it or not, with practice you can improve your self control. All right, um, and we do see this as um, a difference in your childhood. And the reason why we say this is because um, we we did the marshmallow study. And in the marshmallow study, kids in a classroom were all given a marshmallow. And they were told, don't eat the marshmallow. Don't eat the marshmallow. Don't eat the marshmallow. What we found out was kids who ate the marshmallow um, later were those kids who are more successful in school. They were more successful in their social relationships. And then we found out that it's because they have self-control. They can, they can say to themselves, I'm gonna sit here, I'm gonna do my work, then I'm gonna play on my phone. Then I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna do this. They could, they could control their impulse. They had strength in their delayed gratification. It's amazing. So I want you guys to think about it to yourselves. Do I have self-control? How good is my self-control? Can I improve my self-control? How can I improve it? And think about that. Because I think all of us need to improve our self-control in one way or another. All right. The last thing we're going to talk about is the locus of, of control. We have the internal locus of control, which is where you believe that you control the consequences of your behavior, that you are in control. Okay? And then we have the external locus of control where the consequences are outside of my control. Okay. So internal, you control your fate. External, you believe that, you know, it's written in the stars. And this is what is, is you know, my, my purpose of being. All right. And what we've actually found out is that those who have a greater internal locus of control have better academic achievement. They um, show greater effort to learn. They have a positive attitude to exercising. They have a lower cigarette smoke. They might not even cigarette. They might not even smoke. They have a lower hypertension and heart attacks. External locus of control. We see this a lot. Um, they have a um, a lower effort to deal with their health. They're more resigned to conditions as is. So think to yourself, do I have an internal or an external locus of control? All right. This is the last slide. I'm going to leave you on this. Take a look. 
It's the bio, psycho, social, 